Hey, welcome into Stone Cold Strows. I'm Brandon Strange alongside Charlie Polillo and Josh Jordan. You can follow Charlie on X at Polillo and read him weekly on sportsmap.com. Josh Jordan, you can follow at Josh Jordan 975 on X and read his column, read his work daily on sportsmap.com. Uh, we are on a drive to 25. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please subscribe now. We're trying to hit 25,000 subscribers. We need your support to do it. And to show support for the hometown team, please hit like on this video now. And remember, the full version of this podcast is available in audio form right now, wherever you get your podcast. Gents, the uh, the biggest news um, from the uh, preceding couple of days is other than the Astros play much better 7,000 feet above sea level is that uh, minor league masher Joey Loperfito gets the call up. Now Joey is hitting, he's hit 13 home runs in 25 games. This is pretty impressive. Not to throw a cold blanket on it, but last season when John Singleton was called up, he was hitting 333 with 12 homers and uh, an 1100 OPS. So just for perspective, just trying to keep it real. Um, but Charlie, I just want to ask you is, do you think, in your opinion, Loperfito's promotion is connected more towards maybe the uh, Jake Myers lack of success, uh, the black hole that is first base, or just the general lack of power and them really looking to add a spark to this lineup? Oh, look, the root of this is that Jose Abreu is more in need of formaldehyde than an energy drink. Um, checked as I could. Turns out the Astros were not able to get a hold of Abreu's passport and visa in Mexico. And oops, we can't find it. And Jose can't get back across the border with the ball club. So he and his contract are still an albatross uh, attached to the Astros. And with John Singleton as alternative one, I mean, come on. I've used a couple of metaphors for the Abreu-Singleton combo to this point. Um, you know, Abreu managed to soar over the 100 mark so briefly, but back down to 99 for his batting average stateside. And that's not about conversion rate. That's about just sucking. John Singleton is not a major league worthy ball player. It's not personal. It's business. So uh, Loperfito, the power stuff obviously wows you. 37 strikeouts in 101 at-bats, AAA is a problem. He's going to whiff an extremely high percentage of the time as a major leaguer. But <laughs> what, like Abreu and Singleton don't? And so if Loperfito delivers some of the power, right, his first home run will be more than Abreu and Singleton have combined. By the way, more than Abreu and Singleton and Alex Bregman and Chaz McCormick have combined. So he has to be up here to play uh you alluded to jake myers uh he and mccormick have been two thuds in in the outfield loperfito thought to be more of a natural outfielder but not thought to be a plus defensive center fielder another kind of noodle arm out there wouldn't be much of a drop off from myers or mccormick throwing it in center field but this has to be at minimum platooning at first base um you know singleton can't be optioned to the minors without his permission, so what? If someone doesn't claim him on waivers, wow, that would be shocking. Uh, you DFA him, release him, and then if he wants to go to the minors, because what if Loperfito comes up and flops, then what? Oh, you have to rush John Singleton back onto the roster? Uh, they can go a couple of other different ways, right? Graham Kessinger, Gray Kessinger is basically in, in mothballs, hardly ever plays. They can just send him out if they don't want to have to do other roster gymnastics, but they do have to create a 40-man spot um, to promote low profito to the major leagues. That's easily accomplished. They could release Kendall Graveman. He's in the last year of his contract. He's out for the year injured. So they can come up with that aspect of it. But low profito, left-handed thumper. First two games of the series with the Guardians. The Astros are facing Carlos Carrasco, right-hander, and Tristan McKenzie, right-hander. Low profito needs to be in the lineup at first base in both of those games. The Thursday finale, they face a lefty in Logan Allen. So, you can throw a Brayu in that data. Give him a chance to get back over 100. It's interesting, right? Because if they were just doing this by performance, you'd get rid of a Brayu. I mean, it's, but Singleton hasn't been good, but he's been better than a Brayu. But they're committed to all that money. And, and I thought it was very interesting that Chandler Rome mentioned in the athletic, they've reached out to Jim Crane a, a couple times 
recently about just getting a comment from him and he's not looking to make any comments right now. So I'm sure part of that's about Abreu and the start to the season and, and that terrible contract they're stuck with. But yeah, I think Loper Fido is going to play to Charlie's point. He's not just playing first base in the minors. He, he's playing a lot of center field. In fact, his last two games, he played center field and then he played first base a couple games. So, I mean, I think you just take what you can get, get him out there, see, see what he can do. I think Debon's starting to show you too, that, He's a pretty good option in center field. He made a hell of a throw the other day to, to keep a runner at second base. He just fired it in a third. And, and you know, we're we're very familiar with what he can do out there, especially when Verlander starts. But I wouldn't be surprised if we see a little more Dubon with, with Jake Myers and Chaz struggling this year. But I want to see what Loperfito can do. That seemed like the, the team got along well with him in spring training, felt like he, he kind of he belonged. So, and that's what Dana Brown said too, after that, that hot spring and they decided to, you know, put him in the minors. He was like, let's see if he continues what he did in spring in the minors. And he's done that. So to their credit, they're bringing up, bringing him up, giving him a shot, but also they have to, they, they right. don't have many other options and they're, they're, they need a spark. They need to get something out of first base. So uh, I'm really excited to see what he can do. Yeah. I think they've been clinging to the hope that, well, Bray will warm up. He can't stay this bad. He can't stay this bad. Wait, he's getting worse? Wait, well, he can't be any worse than that. Wait, he can? That Loperfito's only played seven games at first base this season. They're a little slow in giving him a, a taste there. He's played some before. But athletically, he'll be all right. Right? He's played a little bit of second base. He's a bigger guy, 6'3", 220, that he played any second base at that size is kind of an outlier. So, uh, And throw in, I mean, not to pile on Abreu, except to pile on Abreu. I mean, routine pop-ups and balls you expect a first baseman to dig out of the dirt more often than not, it's like his motor skills across the baseball board have just vanished. So, uh, Loperfito, how can he be a step down from what Abreu has given you in any area? I mean, if they each reach on an error, right? Abreu runs with a refrigerator on his back. Loperfito has speed, 20-plus stolen bases in the minor leagues last year. So there is zero reason to call him up to not play him against all right-handed pitching. And first base to me is the obvious, obvious slot, uh, whether Singleton's on the roster or off. Um, all Joey needs is a couple of hits, and then we'll have to settle on a, a nickname. The Italian stallion was used up like 50 years ago. Well, Charlie, going back to your original point, at this point, I'm I'm all for the entire team being unable to get back into the States because between a field that looks like it was greased with Crisco and balls that like once they get up in any sort of elevation look like they're into hit into outer space. Uh, Kyle they, Tucker with a lazy fly to ball left field and oh it's gone over 400 feet. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, crazy, right? It makes Denver look normal. With a, like a 46 degree launch angle or something crazy like that. Uh, yeah, like comically. And and what's funny is it seemed to ail or it seemed to, you know, uh, heal what ailed the Astros offense, except for the aforementioned Jose Abreu, who still can't get enough lift on the ball to even take advantage of the thin air in Mexico City. Now, another thing that was brought up on the broadcast that I wanted to talk with you guys about as soon as I heard it was... Um, Fromber Valdez. And we saw Fromber make his return from the IL. He looked pretty good. He's not obviously not stretched out, but uh, had a high number of strikeouts, um, you know, getting ground balls, doing the things that we're, we're used to seeing Fromber Valdez do. But one of the things that the broadcast talk, talked about was how he was attributing the inflammation uh, in his forearm to his sinker and use of the sinker. Now he relies on that sinker to get a lot of ground ball out. So are you concerned that, you know, a guy who he's coming out of the, you're coming out of the off season. So, you, you know, there's no winter ball. There was no, you know, WBC. There's nothing to really attribute overuse. Uh, and he already having, you know, suffering from inflammation and, and saying it's from overuse of that sinker. That's kind of a big weapon for him. Are you concerned that we're, he's attributing that one of his most powerful, potent weapons, aside from that curveball, uh, to that inflammation? Yes, uh, that would be troubling unless the connection they're making is that, you know what? I have been overthrowing that sinker, which contributed to the lack of sink over the second half of last season, whether Fromber was seduced by the increased numbers on the on the radar gun. 
Um, and it's really tough to judge much of anything playing in Mexico City. Right? Bigger picture for the Astros, ah, two wins. When you're bleeding out, anything will serve as a tourniquet. So just a different environment and all the hoopla of the appearances. and so They're also facing the Colorado Rockies. Yep. Right, who are just an atrocity of a of a big league roster. So that the Astros have turned it around would be silliness. But hey, they got the two very badly needed wins. Um, Fromber, I would think if anything, it's more 450 innings of work over the last two seasons that may be contributing to just cumulative toll. Um, because if he can't throw that sinker, he's not going to be a high quality starting pitcher, as you mentioned. It's one of his primo weapons, at least when on his game but hey at least he looked good presuming he comes out with no soreness and as we talked about some right those who already went dead and buried mode on the astros silly rabbits uh this early in a division where first place is barely over 500 but verlander two solid starts from her back presuming good health two out of three good starts christian javier rejoins this weekend Ronel Blanco is not going to continue to pitch to a sub two earned run average. That's okay. If he pitches to a low threes ERA and he's the number four starter, because the horses you expect to be one, two, three are in there. That goes a long way toward riding the ship. And then in this Cleveland series, Hunter Brown, Spencer Araghetti, bookending Verlander start an ongoing auditions for that number five spot until someone else gets healthy. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a challenging week. Right. First place teams as of starting the week, Cleveland, big surprise in the central and then Seattle. Right? It's a very big for the first weekend of May series. The Astros opening the week, six games back of the Mariners. They come in and dust you three and you're looking to be nine, ten games out. That would be serious. Oh, not kick dirt over them. But for uh, overlapping the end of April, early May, it's a big, big week. It is, and I. This team looks very different when it's Blanco and Verlander, and Fromber, and you're starting to get the like. Okay, may, they may be okay if these guys get healthy and Javier returns. And I just thought it was interesting that they decided to send JP France down, and that they kept Arigetti with the big league club. Hunter Brown's been atrocious this year. I just think they they see the upside with him, and it's funny. Dana Brown was on the flagship station, and I heard him make a comment about. Oh, that's great that, you know, France was able to limit the damage after the five runs, but you got to make that pitch before you give up the five runs. And he's like, you know, you're just not giving your team a chance. And as I was listening to it, I was like, JB France might be in some trouble here. Just kind of from what I'm hearing from Dana Brown, he doesn't seem, seem very pleased. And, and there you had it. JP France was the guy that went down. I will say this too. It was nice in that finale to, to see the bullpen kind of operate the way they kind of drew it up to where those guys were coming in, getting out, you know, Montero, and then all your back of the bullpen guys, seven, eight, nine came in, did their thing. So I'm glad to see that the starting pitching got better and the relief pitching looked kind of how they drew it up. So hopefully that continues moving forward. I think the unfortunate probability of reality with JP Francis, he caught the league by surprise. Yep. Over his first two, three months, his first 17 starts, he was a revelation and a needed revelation in the Astros rotation. Frankly, pitched better with the Astros than he ever had over his minor league career where he always had control problems. And then you look at how he finished last season, right, the very last outing in game seven against the Rangers and the way he started this year, um, whether, you know, finding his way back toward his professional baseball mean uh, Brown and Araghetti's upside vastly exceed that of France. With Hunter Brown, though, tick-tock, at least for 2024, you can't come, keep running him out there on a regular. Hey, he did get his ERA below five, 10 uh, the, the last time out, but Hunter Brown, other than the first month of last season, has nothing that says he belongs in a, in a big league rotation. Well, if you have Verlander, Fromber, Javier, Blanco, you can go with someone else as the fifth, other than Hunter Brown and Araghetti gets another audition on Thursday. And while the circumstances in Mexico are weird, I think one of the positives we can take away is goes to Josh's point, which is your, your starters and your bullpen limited damage in a place in which routine uh, fly balls can go out the ballpark and spin rates aren't exactly, you know, plus in that elevation. And so you had, uh, you know, guys be able to, control damage and so you got to see you know uh presley and hater uh look a little closer to what we assumed they would look like um 
And, you know, look, I all due respect to France, who did a very serviceable job on this team last year and was exactly what they needed. I, I think Aragetti fits more into what this team is really looking for, which is swing and miss stuff. Like he has true, even again, even getting blown up in, in, in the cases in which had, you can see there is some really nasty swing and miss stuff there. Now, Grand, it remains to be seen whether the, the league catches up to him the way it has uh, uh, Brown and France. But uh, Charlie, bef- on our way out, give me your general thoughts on what you've seen early on uh, Aragetti. Uh, you know, not electric stuff, but good stuff. Name of the game also with Aragetti is command, right? The Astros' entire pitching staff so far this season has just walked way too many batters. Fundamentally, it's because unworthy pitchers have been throwing too many innings. Right? With Verlander settled in, he's not going to be regularly, right? The control was at issue and limited his innings the last time out. Uh, but Verlander's not going to be walking four guys per nine innings unless he falls off the table here. Right? Fromber's not a high walk guy. Uh, Javier, if he makes some progress in that area, right? He has electric stuff, not 98, 99, but just the invisible fastball and so forth. Um, I think Aragetti's ceiling is probably middle to back end of the rotation. Well, that has tremendous value, right? If you're going with replacement level guys or worse in the four and five spots of your rotation, replacing that with, okay, middle of the pack is a meaningful upgrade. So if Aragetti can get there, uh, starting Thursday or, or going forward, that's fine. Anybody else kind of get Lance McCullers vibes watching Eric yes, Getty with the hair and their deliveries kind of walking so many guys. Similar? Yeah. Yeah. And uh and can implode very quickly. Yeah, no, there, there's definitely definitely got those vibes there. And you know, look, our Ar- you know, uh could be around the corner as well. And so you're really gonna bolster what's really been a thin uh, rotation and, and hopefully now you're going to have some of those tough decisions that it looked like you were going to have to make at the beginning of the season. Uh, that's going to be it for part one of this episode of Stone Cold Strohs to listen to the full episode. Like we said earlier, it's available right now uh, on whatever your podcast uh, platform of choice is. So you can go listen to that now, or if you want to watch the rest of this conversation, just check back uh, tomorrow and we'll have it posted on this channel on YouTube. And as always, Ghost Rose.